Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. we were talking about flow testing of nozzles, and that was with the baby bottles. So here we go. Turn this on. There we go. Flow test. Flow test. All right. Use cups of equal size. Okay, come here, buddy. Over here. This way, this way, this way. Who does he look like? It's little MJ. <laughs> MJ. <laughs> it's little me. Uh, it's little MJ. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Come on, we're doing but he looks stupid in that picture. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Isn't he cute? What's up, little man? MJ, Who's it's on? your son. You can say hi. Hi. How old are you? Um, eight. Um, eight. eight. What are you going to go do now when, when you get out of here? Are you the Fortnite guy? <laughs> he is Mr. Fortnite. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Thanks. Shirt's on backwards. Score. <laughs> We'll just edit that out. Okay. Uh, flow test. Flow test one. So we use cups of equal size. And that's very important because if they're not of equal size, then it really doesn't give you the proper uh, results. And then baby bottles. This isn't, this isn't me. This is actually what Light Comic says. Baby bottle is suggested. In fact, my wife was throwing out some baby bottles the other day. I'm like, I need those. Flow should be equal. Uh, here, never, never. This sounds like a test question right here. Never clean nozzles with wire because we all have safety wire or drills. Our recommended, or is here, Andy, recommended cleaner per service instruction. I realized I was writing kind of fast. Service instruction one, two, seven, five, Charlie. That was the last one I read is they want you to use hops. Hops number nine for 20 minutes, for 20 minutes. So you just let the injector sit in it or do you like move it around and clean it with the Just rest? let it sit. And then you rinse with stoddard solvent. Uh, Stoddard solvent, if you're not familiar with it, you will be. It's actually what we use in our carburetor uh, test bench. So it's just kind of a low volatility, low vol yeah, volatile solvent. That was easy to say. Uh, then blow dry with compressed air. Blow dry with compressed air. Compressed air. Uh, big deal here. Big deal is do not over torque. Do not over torque. Uh, I find these things over torqued a lot. So you have to be very careful. Um, the other thing is there are two small lines that you're going to find on aircraft engines. Uh, there are the injector lines and there are the primer lines. And the primer lines look just like injector lines, but they're actually different. And a lot of times the primer lines are just made out of copper, but these fuel injector lines are stainless steel. Um, and they also have a little bit smaller inner diameter. So watch for, watch for primer lines used in place of injector lines. 
uh, injector lines are smaller. Um, oh, torque, here he is. Um, torque is, I, I actually wrote 20, 20 to 25 inch pounds. That's not very much. Um, or finger tight plus one half flat. And that's for the lines, for lines. I believe that, I'm just going to put this. I didn't write in my notes. I'm pretty, my memory is those are for the actual primer lines. And I want to say for some reason, and I could be getting this mixed up with the uh, piston cooling nozzles. They look the same, nearly. Um, that was 65 inch pounds. So for some reason, I want to say that the torque, torque on the nozzles is 65 inch pounds. And then the torque for the primer lines is only 20 to 25 inch pounds. Or what I do, I do finger tight plus half a flat. What's half a flat? What is half a flat? Uh, the, the flat is where the wrench goes. So you just finger tight and then one half of a turn. So just one turn. flat would be so it, the flat went from one and matched. That no, didn't explain it well. Um, I think I know what you mean. Okay. So. So if I, if I brought this to here, that's one flat. But if I brought this to like right there, that's half a flat. That probably didn't make much sense either. Uh, but I think I have a video that shows you. It's important that you inspect uh, the, the uh, injector lines. Lines every 100 hours. 100 hours, um, actually per service bulletin. Uh, last one I have is three, four, two golf, which is airworthiness directive 2015-1907. So there's an airworthiness directive on those primer lines and you gotta make sure you comply with that. Which is you have to look at how they're routed, any chafing, make sure the cushion clamps are, are nice. Um, oh, here we go, right back around. So one, two, three. Um, newer nozzles, the newer style. Newer style nozzles use a removable insert. Use a removable insert. The insert is matched to the body. Um, do not mix up. Do not mix up. And do not try to replace. Um, just the insert or just body. So in other words, they're a match set. So it's like I said. Although don't confuse this one. Um, one, you can mix old nozzles and new nozzles on the same engine, the same engine. So in other words, if you had one bad nozzle and you had to buy a new one, so you called Lyco and like, well, we don't make them like that anymore. We want to make the new style. You don't have to buy all new set. You can just buy one of those nozzles from Lycoming and stick it in there. Oh, here we go. Um, Over-tightening the nut 
on the fuel line will crack the nut. Because it's a brass nut, they crack real easy. So proper torque, one proper torque is 20 to 50 inch pounds. I know I got something different. Or finger tight. Um, and then 30 degrees to 60 degrees. How you doing? I kind of wrote fast on that one, sorry. Hey, SpongeBob is back. I think back. No. Yes. Earlier today, it was just a blank screen. Because I was using my tablet. All right, L, and we're almost done with the Bendix system. Let's talk about adjustments. Adjustments. So, the RSA system only has two adjustments. Two adjustments. What are those adjustments? Idle speed and idle mix. Thank you. <laughs> idle speed, idle mix. I do idle speed and idle mixture. Actually, that's been two idle mixture. Two, one, and two. Uh, adjust idle speed to proper idle, which would be 550 to 700 RPM. Now that seems like a pretty big range. And honestly, it just, it depends on the engine. You know, if an engine likes to run slow and it runs slow, smooth, and it doesn't want to die out and it's happy there, then I'm going to go there. If it doesn't seem to want to run smooth until I get it a little bit higher, uh, then I'm going to run a little bit higher. It's just every engine's a little bit different depending on how they are and maybe <clears throat> the condition of the valve and the cam and uh, the intake system and stuff like that. Um, adjust. Idle mixture. To obtain a 25 to 50 RPM rise at idle cut off. There we go. I have a question for you. Um, on the uh, when you bring it back to idle, you said five fifty to uh, seven fifty RPM. But yep. on like my aircraft or yours, I'm pretty sure it says in the manual when you bring it back, but like when you're turning off the engine, it says bring back below a thousand RPM. Yeah. But, but that's supposed to be idle, but that's above seven fifty. So is it not actually in idle when you turn it off because it's above 750? That's correct. Or, 
So should, as a, like, as a pilot and a mechanic, when you turn it off, should you bring it even further down to 550 to 750? I do. Okay. Well, occasionally. Sometimes I, I don't. Um, I like to run a little bit higher if I've been idling so that I can um, burn off the plugs and make sure they're not fouled out or anything. But, you know. But I check it periodically. All right, I didn't write this down, uh, but you're gonna see it a couple times and it's gonna be a big deal when we are uh, doing our annual, or to our annual inspection, so Zeus, um, when you're doing your orals. But when you're doing an annual inspection, one of, the, one of the things you have to do, while there's only two adjustments, the adjustments are idle speed and idle mix. Idle mix is right here on this. Idle mix, and there's even a little R right here that shows that way. So that would be go rich this way, and this would be go lean this way. And then my idle speed is right up here. There's just a little screw, and I just stick the screwdriver in there, and if I screw it in a little bit, then it means that this doesn't, the throttle valve doesn't close quite as far. It doesn't close quite as far. It's gonna run a little bit faster. So just like we keep saying, or I keep saying, is that I'm gonna go in the aircraft, I'm gonna start it up, I'm gonna run it, make sure it's warm, make sure it's operating temperature. I'm gonna pull the, the mixture level all the way back and I'm gonna watch it. If I get a 25 to 50 RPM rise, I'm good. If I get 75 to 100, that's too rich. So I'm just gonna come over here and the, the R goes that, that way. And I'm just gonna go the opposite way of the R in a couple of two, three, four clicks, get in the airplane and try it again. It's absolute trial and error. And so get in, start it up, run it again. It's important though that every time you, you do and you start it up, you speed the engine up a little bit, bring it back to idle, idle cut off. They always want you to clear it out a little bit first and then bring it back. So I'm going to set that. And then when I'm done, I'm going to look at my idle RPM. If I'm happy, great. If I'm not, I'm just going to come in here and adjust this screw. If I want it to go a bit slower, I'm going to back it out a little bit. If I want to go a bit faster, screw it in a little bit and it just like I said, holds the throttle valve open. But the other thing you have to do with this on, on the annual inspection or 100 hour inspection, this doesn't really sit the way I want it, sorry. Just look away so you don't puke. Is, there we go, is this is where the fuel line connects from the fuel pump. So you have this fuel line coming around, here's a fuel line around here. Right inside of here is where you're gonna find the fuel screen. So you have two choices. Choice number one is you can disconnect the fuel line, cap it, then take this and take it off, or you can go the easy route and just take this. We have to cut some safety wire and you can pull this out. And then on the other side of that is the fuel screen. So you got two choices. And what do you think everybody wants to do? Take the fuel line off. Well, I hope so, because that's the right way. So this way right here, when you pull it out this way, you actually dump all of the debris out into the, into the, not the carburetor, but the fuel injection system. And then you look at it and go, well, that looks pretty good. And you put it back in. Well, it looked pretty good because you just dumped everything out. So even though it is capped on this side, you don't ever take this side off. You gotta go the long way through. You gotta take the fuel line off, which as you know, I've said that's very dangerous because if you don't put it back on, uh, you risk killing people. And you'll, you'll see me get kind of a, you know, a little, wild with you if you are working on an engine or any of the projects we're working on we're going to be doing a lot of them and i will definitely discount your grade on that project if i find any fuel lines that were put on by hand so the rule is you take a fuel line you put it on you better have a wrench right there in your hand and you finish tightening it you don't ever walk away from a fuel line that's hand tight never never don't even turn your back on it because they look tight and with the way that they um, fit on this flare right here. Most of the time, even a hand tight uh, fuel line, it, it may not leak at low pressure. It won't leak until you start getting to high pressure. And I told you guys about the one that just backed off within seconds every time they went to full throttle and, and really hurt people. So anyway, to get that out, you have to take it out of this way. And that's a special fitting where that fits inside of there. I guess the new ones are actually brazed and welded right on here. 
anyway, so you pull it out in one shot and it comes out that way. But you take that, we're going to look a little video about how to clean these things. So I'm going to ask you that on oral, how do you clean that screen? And you say, what? I'm like, well, you can take the fuel line off and then take it out or just take the cap off. And half the class goes, well, I'm just going to take the cap off. And that would be the wrong answer. Kevin. Yep. What is, what is that has uh, the other cap line? Do what, what? What is it for? Oh, the cap? Uh, most of the time, stuff like that's just easier to drill it, drill the passage that way. You got to drill all the way through. Say, so just drill it. I don't know exactly why they put the cap there, but I think that's why. It's just easiest way to make it. All right. Um, starting, starting these things. Let me see. Am I almost out of room here? I am. All right. Oops. You're on a roll, Kevin. I'm on a roll. You had some five hour energy, huh? No, I didn't. I never had that stuff. Line paper, there we go. Uh, he had one of those yerba mates or whatever they're called. <laughs> I, had, I had a stuffed bell pepper is what I had. All right, starting. You know, the one thing we don't have at City College is a working, running Bendix fuel injection system. We've got lots of Continental systems. Uh, they start the same. So engines with fuel en engines with fuel injection. Uh, do not have primer systems. Do not have primer systems. I'm only aware of one, and that's the Skymaster. It's the only one I've ever seen with a primer system. Uh, say the engine is, quote, primed with fuel from the fuel injection. Fuel from the fuel injection. You know what? Let me see. I still have this open and I have it paused. I left it wide open too. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right, so to start a fuel injected engine, what I would do, uh, first of all, make sure you read the pilot operating handbook because I'm not reading the POH. But in general, in general, so we usually have these back in idle cutoff from when we stop the engine. Stop that. All right, so idle cutoff. So I want to start the left engine. What I'm going to do is watch, so here's where's my fuel flow, manifold pressure, fuel flow. All right, so I, I click on the boost pump and I'm actually running the boost pump. And if you had sound, if I actually, well, I could do that. We do have sound. We do have sound. I do, okay. So with your sound, you can hear the boost pump running. Now you can hear it turned off, right? Um, best to have your avionics off when you're doing this. Okay, so bring the boost pump on, notice I have no fuel flow. And so to prime the engine, what I'll do is I'll bring this up and I'll wait until I get fuel flow and then shut it off. And then I'll reach over and then it's kind of hard because you need three hands, but you're going to hit the start. And as soon as it catches, I'll bring up the mixture control. And so you get that running the same thing. I'm going to turn on the right, right boost pump and I'm good. And so I'll bring this up until I get fuel flow. Once I get fuel flow, I can bring that back down. catches bring up my mixture now sometimes you give it too much fuel and then what happens is you find yourself down here uh, uh, 
find yourself cranking and cranking and cranking and cranking. So what you have to do is what you have to do is a um, a flooded engine start, which takes even more hands. So you bring this over all the way up. You hit the start, and as it starts, you pull this back and this forward. Sometimes I've even had it where. Engine's not running. I know. I can't move the throttles fast enough here. Let's see. So, will this let me do it? So, boost pump on. Do I have fuel flow? Did we get fuel flow? A little bit of fuel flow. since the beginning of class at wide open throttle. I know. I thought it was paused. Otherwise, we would have heard it. So, okay. So, engine's primed with fuel from the fuel injector. And, of course, like I've said before, you really have to be careful that uh, you don't uh, hydro lock it. Um, engine's primed with fuel from the fuel injection system. As follows. As follows. So, all right. Um, one, place, throttle, one-eighth, one-eighth open. Not an eighth of an inch, that would be ridiculous, but an eighth of the way open. Um, place mixture at idle cutoff. Uh, three, run boost pump. Now, at this point, you can run that boost pump safely as long as you want. Nothing's going to happen because you're an idle cutoff. So you don't have to worry about it. Four, move mixture full rich. Move mix to full rich. Full rich until, until you see fuel flow indication. Now, when you see a fuel flow indication, remember that's simply a pressure gauge that's tied into the man to the uh, manifold valve, manifold valve, the distributor valve. Sorry. Um, so you have the distributor valve. So that means that you've got fuel all the way to the distributor valve and through this port and up to to the uh, flow gauge. So you're just reading pressure that you got pressure that far. So then you can move mix. back to idle cutoff, because you don't want to flood it out. You don't want to do a hydraulic lock. And then four, five, six, engage starter. Starter and seven, when engine starts. Move mixture to full ridge, move mix to full rich. And my last little point I want to make about this 
is venting. A lot of times people take venting for granted. August said piston rings are now busted. Well, it's a lot worse than the piston rings when you, when you uh, the piston, the piston rings, the connecting rod, the crankshaft, everything goes bad. So anyway, people take venting of the fuel tanks for granted and it's a pretty big deal. Um, I've talked to several people who have been flying low wing planes that have had uh, a vent cap problem where that wasn't venting the wing and they looked out and the wing was actually being sucked flat. And it's like, whoa, you know, and they'll do a kind of emergency landing. And, and usually as they pull the power back, there's enough air starts getting back in, the tank will pop out. If not, when they land, they release that, that uh, fuel cap, pow, the, the tank goes back to normal. I've never seen it myself, but I've heard it'll happen, which is to say that the fuel pump is strong enough to collapse the tank, to give it for so long, and then it'll stop. It just won't get any more. So systems that use systems that use fuel pumps. Well, I shouldn't write this. Um, must have proper fuel tank venting. Well, all systems must have proper venting. So maybe it's syst all systems should have proper venting. Let's just write that. Let's just be correct about this. All fuel systems must have proper venting. All fuel systems. must have proper venting. The Cessna 150s had an airworthiness directive. They came out of the factory with two vents. They had one vent, I think, um, that'd be the left, right, so the right tank had a vent in the, in the cap and the left side had a vent that went um, through the airframe and out. And so it, was, it, it cross vented both sides, there was two vents. Well, they had a problem and for whatever reason, I don't know what the problem was exactly, but there, it came out with an AD that you now have three vents. So every cap is vented and it has a, another vent built into it through the airframe that goes out by the left strut. Uh, okay, so all systems must have proper venting. There, I like that better. Um, well, then we'll put this. Um, systems with a fuel pump can collapse a fuel tank if not vented properly. So not only would you lose your engine eventually, but you'll collapse your fuel tank. So two bad things. All right, that's all the notes I have on this particular system. But I do want to watch this video with you guys. This is, um, it's kind of old, but it's actually, it's really, really good, I think. So I just have to pull it up. Precision Airmotive has a 50-year reputation for quality and skill in radial engine overhaul and repair based on expert workmanship, advanced overhaul equipment, and strict standards of quality control. Precision Airmotive is able to return better than new engines to its customers. We take great pride in our reputation earned through decades of performing safely and dependently under all flying conditions. 
Precision Air Motive expanded the scope of production operations to include the manufacture and support of aircraft engine carburetors and other accessory components. We're the only source for original factory new Bendix pressure carburetor parts and RSA fuel injection systems, formerly Bendix. This video presentation was produced to familiarize you with and ease you into the proper RSA fuel injection system maintenance techniques. Additionally, we'll feature our effective five-step approach to troubleshooting the RSA fuel metering system. And we'll show you the proper method for executing the engine hot starting procedure. Precision RSA fuel injection system was originally designed by Bendix in the early 1960s and surprisingly very few technicians are familiar with its required maintenance items. It steadily evolved through the years to the advanced system we know today. The RSA fuel injection technology used in today's aviation fuel injection systems is a state-of-the-art system. Proper preventative system knowledge and maintenance is the easiest way to help keep the system operating to its full engine TVO. Let's start with the fuel servo unit. Maintenance on the fuel servo unit is required at 50 hour intervals. The inlet filter must be inspected and cleaned after the first 25 hours of operation and then at 50 hour intervals. By the way, the filter should be inspected and cleaned at each annual regardless of accumulated hours since the last inspection. Inlet fittings vary from union type fittings to 90 degree elbows. Be careful. These fittings are specifically modified for the filter assembly. Now, to get at the filter, you need to first remove the inlet fitting. Don't, however, remove the plug opposite the inlet fitting to get at the filter. Doing this allows any contamination that is on the filter to be introduced into the servo unit. Remove the fitting using clean, correctly sized wrenches. Once the fitting is removed, it's easy to remove the filter. If the filter is permanently attached to the inlet fitting, it's not considered a bypassing type and should be replaced. Filter inspection is fairly easy. Checking the outside surface for particulate matter or paring down the middle isn't enough. The fuel flows from the inside out when installed in the servo unit. Contamination, after all, will show up here on the inlet filter long before it can cause any kind of operational problem. Now's the time to catch it by locating and correcting the source of contamination. Dry the filter with air. Now, tap it. Open side down on a clean piece of paper. Examine any contamination and determine the type and source. Next, look into the center of the filter while shining a light through the outside. You should be able to see the light through the weave on most surface areas. You could also blow through the dried filter. There should be very little restriction to airflow. Clean the filter using acetone or MEK, followed by a rinse in stoddard solvent and then air drying. If the fitting is damaged or corroded, it must be replaced. By the way, corrosion is a fairly good indication that the aircraft fuel system contains a high level of water contamination. Obtaining precision air motive O-rings, and only these specific O-rings, is essential before you begin the filter cleaning process. We recommend you always replace these packings each time the filter is cleaned. Standard AN or MS O-rings might appear identical, but using the wrong O-ring on the inlet fitting has been known to exert sufficient force to crack the servo unit housing. Refer to Service Bulletin RS-44. Check the precision part numbers to ensure you're flying with the proper O's. While you're at it, inspect all fuel hoses for signs of deterioration. Teflon lines in most cases should be installed between the servo unit and flow divider, pressurizing valve or splitters. Refer to the appropriate engine or airframe maintenance manual for specific information. Also, take a look at Lycoming Service Instruction 1274 for additional information on hose application. For filter installation, refer to the appropriate service manual for installation and torque instructions. Cleaning the fuel injection nozzles is next. Hoppy's number 9 gun cleaning solvent's the best cleaning solution. A 20 to 30 minute soaking's all that's usually necessary. Then, follow with solvent rinse and then air dry prior to inspection. A nozzle is not necessarily clean and satisfactory for use if the cleaning solution no longer changes color. The proper inspection of field inspecting these assemblies is through the use of a 10 power magnifying glass. Both fuel nozzles and fuel restrictors should be shiny clean with no evidence of film or particulate contamination. 
Only proper inspection can verify a nozzle has been properly cleaned. An increase in indicated fuel flow at various power settings is generally the first indication that nozzles need cleaning. Engine operational problems occur if contamination becomes extreme. Substantial fuel stains around a nozzle also indicate the need for cleaning. And, like the filter, any unusual contaminant should be identified and its source located and corrected. Be sure to refer to Bendix Bulletin RS-77, Revision 2, and Lycoming Service Instruction 1414. Do not, under any circumstances, use lock wire, pins, or other metal items to remove contamination from the nozzles. This affects calibration. When cleaning two-piece nozzle assemblies, be sure each restrictor is kept with its respective body. Simply use separate containers for each nozzle assembly. If you're only cleaning the restrictors, which is permitted between annual inspections, work with each cylinder separately by removing, cleaning, inspecting, and reinstalling the restrictor and reconnecting the fuel line. Remember, if you lose a fuel restrictor, you'll have to buy an entire new nozzle body assembly. These restrictors are flow matched to their respective bodies and are only sold as assemblies. Only proper inspection can verify a nozzle has been properly cleaned. The nozzles used with the Precision Air Motive Fuel Injection System have a fuel orifice diameter of approximately 28 thousandths of an inch. As mentioned before, the only proper method of field inspecting these assemblies is through the use of a 10 power magnifying glass. With older style nozzles, check the top threads at the fuel line connection for damaged threads and or cracks. New and old style nozzles for normally aspirated engines are interchangeable with one another and may be used in any combination on an engine. By the way, standard nozzles flow at 32 pounds per square inch. Now, there are assemblies referred to as high flow nozzles. The inserts of these high flow nozzles are identified with a step on their circumference and have a larger diameter to prevent installation into the wrong body. Always refer to the engine manufacturer's publications prior to ordering replacement nozzle assemblies. Now, inspect the nozzle fuel lines before installing your freshly cleaned nozzles. Although these lines are supplied by the engine manufacturer, their condition is critical to the proper operation of the system. Here's what to check. The inside diameter of lines used on most engines should be 85 to 95 thousandths of an inch. If a replacement is needed, do not substitute other lines like the smaller ID primer lines. A small line on any one cylinder can cause that cylinder to run leaner than the others. By the way, line length is not critical to the operation of the precision air motive system. Check the lines for signs of longitudinal twisting, a sign of over-torqued nuts. Also, inspect for kinks. The minimum bend radius for a line is 62 hundredths of an inch. Check the nuts for cracks. And inspect the ferrule braze joint and surrounding area for cracking. Fuel dye stains are the giveaway. Install the nozzles using a clean six-point deep well socket. You'll likely have to install your socket over the nozzle first and then attach your extensions and torque wrench. Nozzles are so often damaged by trying to force a socket and extension past engine baffling and over a partially installed nozzle. Baffling's also damaged. Torque nozzles or nozzle bodies to 40 inch pounds. 60 inch pounds is the absolute maximum torque to be applied. In a very few instances, your installation might require the alignment of the A. In such cases, increase the torque according to the manual instructions, but don't exceed the maximum torque allowances referred to in the RSA Operations and Service Manual. On nozzles installed horizontally, the A should point down 30 degrees. Remember, if you have the newer two-piece assemblies, check to ensure that the fuel restrictors are properly installed. On engines that have nozzles installed horizontally, leave the shipping cap installed until you connect the fuel line.
Improper line connection is a common source of damage. Again, with the two-piece nozzles, failing to follow procedures usually means a new set of nozzles. When installing nozzle fuel lines, make certain all threads are clean. It's first necessary to install the nut finger tight. Now, you have two options. Try to use a torque wrench with adapters, if room permits, and torque the nut 25 to 50 inch-pounds. Or, use a standard 7 16 inch open-end wrench and continue to tighten the nut one-half to one-flat of the nut from the finger-tight position and stop. This technique has proven to provide the 25 to 50 inch-pound torque limit. Exceeding the 50 inch-pound torque limit usually does result in nozzle damage. When you've completed the fuel system maintenance, recheck that nothing was overlooked. Pressure test the system for fuel leaks with mixture and idle cutoff. Now you're ready for ground run. Minor adjustment of idle speed and mixture if necessary. And return to service. And don't forget your logbook entry. Of course, in all cases, please refer to the proper manual. Cool. Well, it's about that time. Hey, MJ, were you on your phone during that whole thing? <laughs> what does it say? Hey. It's <laughs> you hear me? Yeah. Hey, can you see me? Uh, I'm not moving, huh? No, we can hear you. Oh, I, I was watching the video on my phone because my computer would, like, skip through it. So then it wasn't like a video, it was more like a slideshow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, we got happening. we got the proof right here, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching it, I swear. <laughs> uh, All right. Well, I guess we can finish this tomorrow. Yep. And uh yeah, because we're over at 750, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We got like we'll two minutes up tomorrow. But... Um, yes. I don't know, it's kind of like I said, it's old, but I think it's really, really good information. So I'm, I'm over here taking little notes. Oh, so I should say this. I should say that. So anyway, yeah, well, I'll see you guys video. tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, the Kevin. knowledge, Kevin. Good night. Good night.